tight in you know within that tight intimacy and it and the the text has the it has the barbello and then it has the pentad the of the aeons of the father and then it has further unfolding so the, it's not it's not distant in the same sense that that um Kabbalah might talk about it but there is a sense of there is um decreasing level of intimacy then there's a then there's a definite breach with Sophia creating creation of Yelda Sophia's creation of Yelda Bayoth and the whole realm of Yelda Bayoth, the cosmos created by Yelda Bayoth is distinct from the whole realm of the Aeons. And the, the text is very clear on that. So I don't want to try to sort of say that it's all just one big thing. However, it is all contained within the nature of the one, because you know that is that is the, the fundamental theological orientation of the text, I think. Yeah, no, that, that that's uh, uh, I'm really glad that you pointed it out because it, it really gets into uh, my next rant, which is um, uh, Dr. Plasha uh, very cleverly points out that, you know, th the book never says what happens. It never really says the end. We, we read that in because, you know, the for, for all we know, the material world might keep going forever. And the process of ascent and descent, which we'll also talk about, might keep going on forever. Um, but um, on on that topic, so the the Aeonic realm uh, before Sophia's error, um, which which we'll talk about in a moment, because uh, again, drawing from Doctor Pleasure, he has a, a very interesting interpretation of it. Is is viewed as as differentiated beings that in some ways are separate, but are within the one, right? That live right. together in a in in holy harmony in uh, as divine beings, right? That that are that are in some ways are separate, but in some ways are united. Yeah, di uh, dis distinct and differentiated, but not not separate, I think. That's probably right. the best way to put it. That's right. So I, I think a lot of people read this text, and I've read this text, that you know what what we are what happens to us when we die is we we get we lose our identities and we get sucked mm. into the one not 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 the father yeah we get sucked mm. into the one um mm. and then that's that's that right um right. the 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 process that that we saw at the very beginning of the of the text is uh is reversed yeah, everything becomes the one again um, that's that's not there, and uh, the, I actually really don't need to read the book that that carefully to to get an idea of of what its of what its soteriology is, what its salvation uh, plan is, which is um, in some ways, and I, I think Christians, uh, what we think of now as Christians, mainstream Christianity, might have actually gacked this, stolen it from the Gnostics, which is we're we're aeons and we will ascend to be aeons and that that is that will be the rest of eternity so um in a way it is uh a much more sophisticated platonic uh idea of of the the quote-unquote uh, boring christian idea of heaven uh the the first father is is sort of like the sun uh, around him revolves the the uh, the planets which will be the aeons which will be us um, I know some people out there are, are, are watching this and being like, isn't that what the Mormons say? And, <laughs> as well as the Christians, because of course we will also be as gods, we will be aeons, and the aeons are basically divinities. Um, but the Mormons, uh, Joseph Smith, you know, he did have some exposure to, to esoteric ideas. So, you know, he is, he is getting some Gnosticism, you know, third, second, fourth hand. So, yeah, like, uh, uh, so I think we are reading the text through later Christian mysticism as well, which, which you know, is, is, is pushing back against this heaven idea. Um, mind you, this is still a much more sophisticated idea than, than heaven. Um, but when I'm talking about how, how other early Christians, because we're still Christians, might, might have stolen this idea from the Gnostics, you know, if, if you read the Bible carefully, if you look at the, the beliefs of the early church, you know, they believed in a, in a physical resurrection, as did many um, uh, uh, co-religionists uh, who were Judeans and uh, what we now call Jews, right? Is that that, that God would, would resurrect us in bodies that would be perfected, right? We would never get sick, tired, old, what have you. Um, uh, our dogs would come back and we would live on this earth as, as perfected beings. Mm -hmm. um and then you know a much later development is this is this heaven idea 
Um, so uh, I think, you know, the, the Gnostics might have been an influence on that. Mind you, I think uh, th th there's some very bad ideas of quote unquote heaven. And of course, this is a, a very uh, sophisticated, troubling, um, uh, infuriating uh, version of that because there's even subtleties within there. So, uh, yeah, th th there's another read in it. And it also helps me too when I. Um, it, uh, I, I'm doing a particularly depressing reading of Gnosticism, which, of course, Gnosticism could already be particularly depressing, it's right? Depressing, yeah. Yes. Um, which is, you know, I, there is an underlining unity in this world. There is something that connects us all. But at the same time, there's, there's division. And when I look around, I only see division. And when I look internally, I only experience division. And... You know, my reading of, of Secret John does say that the vision is all we can have if 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 we want to be beings, right? Um, and division is all we will get. Um, but of course, we will have a much better version of it because, as you said, we are participating in something in this realm to come in this realm that's already existing because it's outside of time. Um, that that is a different kind of division. That, that we could ever imagine, which of course is is also a unity. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a, a harmonious differentiation, maybe. Yes, yes, exactly. It's a harmonious uh, differentiation. And what the Demiurge produced and what we live in is a non harmonious, <laughs> to say the right. least. Uh, differentiation. And, and that also brings us to, quote unquote, Sophia's error, her fall, because I, I think a lot of people read the text and are, are quite disur uh, disturbed by um, misogyny, right? Because, you, you know, uh, although, although I'll, I'll circle back to this, um, it, it basically says, to paraphrase, you, you know, Sophia, without the uh, uh, permission of her, of her partner, uh, without the permission of the other aeons, uh, tries to create. And I think a lot of people read that and say, well, you know, she needs the permission of her husband. And one, like, isn't creation always good? Isn't it great to create? Right. Um, but I think it was, uh, you know, I was asking you about this years ago. And, and I think you pointed out what it, one of the messages, the, the reason for that, or a way that it could be interpreted, is, is, this is this is what happens when we're not in harmony with others. This is what happens when we, when we take our... Uh, uh, our division, our, our individuality uh, too far. Uh, when we act outside of community, so it's not necessarily about her consort and his permission, but the pushing away, the breaking away, uh, and trying to go your own uh, out of an almost egoic fashion, right? Because she wants to create um, all by herself. Um, right. And uh, the in the... Um, in the uh, uh, structure uh, of, of the aeonic unfolding, the permission is always asked. It's always done in unity. And the text is always really, um, always uh, uh, very strong while pointing that out. It that's, is. That, that's yeah. it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I, yeah. I think, um, as always, there are choices made in translation. And the, the term that's getting translated, permission, um, in some translations is translated consent in other translations yeah. and that gives it a very different vibe um, and you're quite right that, that, that as any aeon seeks to do anything they seek the consent of the the invisible spirit and the invisible spirit consents and then the thing happens and so the whole thing happens in a in a harmonious unity um, and then Sophia is the first of the aeons to do something that doesn't involve anybody's consent she just undertakes an action all of her own accord. Um, there's a couple of things that's worth pointing out. So from a, from the point of view of like uh, the, the, the disturbing misogyny of the passage, um, well, that's, you've got to kind of interestingly ignore a lot of things before you get to that point in order to make that interpretation. So Sophia is not a woman, first thing. Um, she's an aeon. So the the um, the aeons are masculine and feminine in the sense that they're in pairs, and one pair has an active vibe, and one pair has a receptive vibe, and that's the sense in which they're masculine and feminine. And then this is a metaphor, and blah 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 blah. She's not a lady. Um, 
but also she's not the first feminine gendered she's by no means by a long stretch not the first feminine gendered figure in the whole story up until this point so it's not like it's not like the only depiction of a feminine figure is the one making the mistake also the first depiction of a feminine gendered figure is barbello who is the first thought of the invisible father and you know the sort of like massively transcendent cosmic figure you know um so I, I think you've kind of got to bracket out a lot of the feminine depictions that happened prior to that point in order to to focus on that particular one also what happens with sophia happens in the different versions I, I think a lot of scholars tend to interpret the the long version of secret john as being a little later it's had mm -hmm. stuff added onto it and the shorter versions as being sort of more primordial um in the history of the text and i like that the shorter versions the later versions add in extra phrases to explain in more detail sophia's error and like exactly how it happened the shorter versions are more kind of gnomic about it yeah. um so even calling it an error is doesn't happen quite so clearly in the earlier texts and and it's and we keep saying sophia which is interesting right so with wisdom right oh, yeah, use, of course i mean using that's... Greek, we're using a greek term but what the text is saying is wisdom. So, so the one's wisdom, right? Because if we're talking about the differentiation of, of various functions of the divine mind in this process of aeonic unfolding, then one of the last that is unfolded is the divine's wisdom. So the divine self-knowledge comes first and then all these eternal qualities of the divine and then the kind of the interior sort of... Um, kind of perfect perfected humanity of the autogenies is formed and then somewhere down the track um the divine's wisdom and what is the first thing wisdom does i mean well i mean to be cheeky <laughs> everything up until now has been these perfectly balanced harmonious everythings you know there's these stages and everything is in harmony and there's all this consent and everything's in balance and it all refers back to the perfect invisible father and so what does god's wisdom do well what's the only thing to balance all this harmony some disharmony <laughs> yeah so is it an error <laughs> yeah exactly well you know and uh, i think dr plesha would uh would, would definitely agree that that it's not and you know, I, I think the central metaphor is, you know, the, the book could be very, uh, uh, very subtle, but I think this is pretty easy to pick up. And it's really funny that, uh, that I started off the show of a rant about how we have to translate the aeons into English terms. And then I just go ahead and say Sophia instead of wisdom. Right. <laughs> um, but I'm so used to it, right? Um, moving in, in, in Gnostic circles and, and such. But of course, wisdom isn't wisdom until you have lived, until you've overcome adversity. Now, this sounds like hack or cliche, but, you know, it, it's, it's true, right? It, it is the only way to become wise. It is the only way for wisdom to develop. Um, and if you are in this harmonious relationship where there are no challenges, where there is no aging and death, then how does wisdom become wisdom? Right. Uh, yeah. I, I see there's, the, a, there's a funny thing that, that it, you know, what, what humanity regards as wisdom, perhaps the, it, that, that's the divine's foolishness, you know, as well. You know, so there's a kind of a potential duality there. And then there's a whole temple take, but we'll come back to that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, and I... I I, I really like, uh, I'm, I'm going to link it up, uh, uh, Dr. Slacko Plesha's, uh, I hope I say, I'm saying his name right, uh, talk that he gave to the AJC and his uh, his awesome book, The uh, the Poetics of the Gnostic Myth. I can't remember what it's called, but it's all about Secret John. I will link it up as well. Uh, please forgive me, Sophia. Uh, anyways, I see this as, as a bit of a read-in, but in the, so, so, I, so I mentioned all this starts when the one seeks to know itself, right? So wisdom has no choice but to want to know the one because it is God's wisdom. But the one is unknowable. So in the Valentinian version of the Gnostic myth, this is what causes the fall, which is very interesting. Sophia seeks to know the unknown father. In, in, this, in this particular case, they actually use the phrase unknown father. The unknown father cannot be known. And Sophia's despair, wisdom's despair, is what creates this world, creates, uh, causes uh, uh, wisdom to fall.
Uh, right. uh, Dr. Plesha, and, and the Valentinians seem to come after this text and are probably using this text, reinterpreting this text, taking bits of this text to turn it into their myth or some version of this text. So uh, Dr. Plesha actually does see that in here. This is, this is what, he, what, what he sees um, uh, uh, starting, starting creation, the, the birth of Yalda Bayov, whatever you want to see. Because it says something like, uh, now wisdom, who, uh, uh, now Sophia, who is the wisdom of afterthought, who, and who constitutes an eternal realm, conceived of a thought from herself with the conception of the invisible spirit and foreknowledge. Who's, so, who, whose translation are you with? Uh, 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 Marvin Mayer's. Afterthought's a really weird translation of. Yeah. Um, I, anyway, I guess I, that's, that's probably pro noia. So, so the, 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 what Doctor Plesha says is: Is this Sophia uh, uh, thinking? This this thought, this wanting to bring something forth, uh, is in imitation of the first father. Is is the thought is wanting to know the first father, right? Um, and the or sorry, I should say the one uh, wanting to know the one, and uh, the um, and then what happens is. The birth of of Yada Bayoff because she cannot know the one, right? Um, or uh, in in his interpretation, actually, she does know the one. She actually succeeds because what what what, what does she you know what do, what does she see that nobody else sees? What does she bring forth from the one through even though it's coming from her? What does she bring forth from the one that nobody else did that no one else dared to do that nobody else could do because they're doing it in harmony, right? Right. Well, they're bringing forth the darkness of the one, the the misshapen, perverted monstrosity of inherent in the one. Yeah, that's right, exactly. <laughs> and and of course, you know, again, this is this is a psychological metaphor because what happens when we turn inwards and uh, experience something dark, misshapen, something that uh, we discovered all on our own without anybody else? Oh, we cast it away. We push it away. Right. Mm -hmm. So we suppress it, and that causes problems later. So I, I, I think he's on to something there. And... That, absolutely. I don't, I, there's a, like the, the specificity of the exact moves Sophia makes yeah. are so bang on in terms of how psychological repression occurs in us during, during human development as children. So that she first, she creates, she makes this thing, then she's revived repulsed by it she's disgusted by it so then she rejects it and yep. pushes it away and then she hides it yep. and then she pretends nothing ever happened like yep. a like a cat that tries to jump on a windowsill and misses you know I, I this entire thing was meant to happen the entire time there's nothing to see here you know yeah Ta -da! And I, and this is the central like what you described what one of the, the central yeah it's what we do it's one of the central insights of psychoanalysis and psychology what basically started you know psychology was was just what you said right this is how how humans develop and Versus you know this, this repression, which is how that, that's how we pack us that's how we pack the different stages of our psyche into little boxes in order to create the process of human development that brings us to adulthood and so so a text that's phrased for adults to be reading as a way of kind of saying okay welcome you wind up in adulthood and it's vexing right <laughs> yeah yeah um the saints tell us we are in fact one with the divine and yet that's not your experience right now is it let's be honest in fact you're not even at one with yourself in yes. fact you're deeply divided you're a mess um what's up with that how did that how did that come about how could that have possibly come about how can you not even know yourself properly right like yes. it's not a matter of intellectual reflection this coming to know yourself it's there's something else there's other things going on it's complex actually yeah how do we account for this complexity by painting a picture of the divine that's just as just as complex as your actual situation there's, well, there is, i've exactly. never seen i've never seen an ancient text that does as good a job of painting the complexity of the human psyche as secret john yeah yeah, I agree. I agree. And, uh, and for that instance, uh, modern texts. <laughs> I, I've seen, there, there are more, but I've seen few modern texts. Right, right. right. Like, I feel like with every passing decade, we look back at Secret John and go, oh, oh, you actually had that on lock already. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, cool. Okay, good. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's incredibly insightful. And, you know, I can't, you know, there's definitely no, I mean, I, I don't know if there's any text in the first 
couple file the uh, till at least I can't think of any text. I can't think of any text that's contemporary or you know up until Freud that that has these kinds of insights. So and and you know it's it's fairly obvious. I I don't think it's a read in right. Like it's 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 you know it's uh, it's it's right there. Um, the the other thing as well, to, the, you know, to have our cake and eat it too for for a double metaphor is uh, and something else that you know even even first time second time readers uh, of the text pick up is when talking about human development uh, to to get it a little bit more literal than instead of just happening inside of a head, which is you know what happens to to a child that uh, that you don't like or for or didn't want to have or for some reason see as inferior and you push it away. How is it going to develop? Right. Um, what happens if you if you don't bring a child into community? Um, uh, you know, I, I think that that is a very powerful metaphor that that is also in the text, because, you know, if, if Sophia had uh, if wisdom had given birth to, to the, this misshapen thing and then said, well, OK, you know, uh, might be ugly, but it's mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come and meet the other aeons. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you if you spend fifteen minutes reading about attachment th modern attachment theory and then read that that narrative, it's like, whoa, that's rough. So deep, deeply heretical take on the whole um, the whole Jesus story. Because the Gospel of John says was in the beginning with God, and uh, nothing was created without Him, and and the Creator is the demiurge. So deeply heretical take is that Jesus is the inca the physical human incarnation of Yaldabaoth. Yeah. The um, uh, and because yeah. I need to, we need to keep going. He's yeah. the physical incarnation of Yaldabaoth, and he's given physical form because spiritual realities are eternal; they don't change, right? Yeah. Uh, change is only possible in the human realm. So, the Yaldabaoth is un incarnated as Jesus to a loving human mother to repair his attachment wound, yeah. because it can't be repaired in the cosmic order; it yeah. can only be repaired in a human being. It's repaired in the life of Jesus, yeah. who then ascends, and that's the beginning of the process of cosmic repair. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, that interpretation, it jives quite well with the text. I don't, think, I don't think anybody else has ever had a go at that, and I, it's, 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 uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like the term heretic. I say cheeky. I think it's a cheeky yeah. interpretation of the text. Yeah. Anyway. Well, uh, uh, Irenaeus says that the Cephians... Uh, his version of the Cephian myth is actually different than what's in this text, but there, there's strong similarities. But then he he goes on, right? Because we never, you know, the, this this basically ends at uh, it ends at Noah, right? So um, so so it doesn't continue. But Irenaeus says something like really weird when he's talking about the Cephians, like they believed that that the demiurge created Jesus and that Jesus was his son. But I believe that an aeon then comes down and fuses with the Demiurge's son. Um, it, it's not really clear, but it, it is clear that, uh, that that Jesus is at least partly of the Demiurge, more more than just in the same way that we are, right? Uh, that the, the, we have the counterfeit spirit, that we uh, partake of uh, some of us have the counterfeit spirit, or we pay, partake of materiality. Then he says something very interesting: that Jesus ascends and rules on the right hand of the demiurge. So, kind of a, I, I believe, as a, as a positive, kind of like tempering the demiurge's rule of the world. I think is the insinuation is uh like jesus doesn't go back to the realm of the aeons but isn't yet but isn't in control of this world and it's just like hey hey stepdad uh sebi dad uh maybe let, let's not have another flood <laughs> let's go a little bit easier on them How about send, that? yeah i'm gonna send another prophet so uh yeah very <laughs> the, the very fascinating stuff um okay so i i mean in some ways this is sort of the we're not going to go through the whole text. I mean, we still are at the very beginning, but of course, you, uh, uh, as you said off air, that would be at least a 15 hour series. I doubt it would be a 15 hour series. It would probably be a lifetime series. We would just die on air if we tried to go through the entire text, you know, uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We could hypothetically at the end of the show um, suggest that if people wanted to be in a study group around Secret John, that, that maybe that might be a Gnostic Wisdom Network thing that might happen at some point in the future. And they should mention that they're interested somewhere. 
if they express interest in uh, the uh, the YouTube com uh, comments or uh, email me, Jonathan at GnosticWisdom.net, I bet you that's something we could get going. So, um, But in some ways, we, we are kind of talking about some of the, the misconceptions that we see about this text, right? And, and one of the misconceptions might be you know, Sophia wisdom as the central character, as the main character, as the, the quote unquote divine feminine. What's what's your take on that? Oh, um, well, it's I mean, I don't know if anybody does actually read Secret John and make that interpretation. Sophia gets a lot of press in the amongst modern Gnostics. And a lot of people, when they are looking for a feminine divine figure, they look to Sophia. And I, I think a lot of that is historical. Um, I think it's because some of the earliest Gnostic material we had was Pista Sophia and that, um, you know, I think, prob which I've never read, but, you know, the Theosophists loved it, see yeah. above, um, and it has it has a sense of the, the kind of the higher Sophia and the lower Sophia, I think, and, and um, has Sophia functioning as a much more salvific figure. I'd argue it's late and probably draws on Valentinian material because Valentinus has the, the Sophia Achamoth is the lower Sophia. And then he has, what's the higher one called? Um, I can't remember, but uh, yeah, I suppose yeah, it might just be Sophia. Yeah. It all gets sort of smushed into this Sophia figure in the later material. And I, it doesn't in secret, John, there's, there's distinct figures that are gendered feminine in the in the text and they've all got distinct functions and it's actually a lot clearer and i think um it would serve people to understand that a little better so primarily like the og who gets the who who does all the work is barbello um who's called pronoia in some other texts the there's another Scythian text called trimorphic protenoia the three forms of the first thought is sometimes translated that way um, same figure. So Pronoia, Protenoia, Barbello are the same initial thought of the invisible spirit um, figure. And that's who kind of creates as a, as a faithful reflection of herself, this Epinoia figure. And the Epinoia figure is the one who comes down into the garden and teaches Adam and Eve and creates the possibility of salvation for them from their kind of benighted state. Um, it's implied in Trimorphic Protonoia that she goes on to manifest multiple times through human history as different figures, and the, the last of whom is debate, possibly debatably Jesus or John the Baptist or somebody, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, summary, Gnostics need to spend a lot less time talking about Sophia and a lot more time talking about Protonoia, in my view, because that's the... You read the Protonoia hymn in Secret John, you read the aratological the, the sort of um self-statement material that that protenoia makes in trimorphic protenoia um and it's the language is so similar to what you read in thunder perfect mind it makes a i think it's a very compelling argument that thunder perfect mind is a very long version of those same self-statements that you see in um in the sethian material that's why it's often classified as part of the sethian corpus um we can do a whole other show on Thunder Perfect Mind. That's <laughs> that's for a, a later time. But um, yeah, that's the transcendent, the the transcendent feminine figure par excellence, right? Yeah. Sophia is the, the benighted feminine, if you like, um, and and you know worth understanding and and for men and women to kind of you know inhale the 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 human reality of that. Um, but if you're looking for a divine feminine. Pranoia is the divine feminine. She is the great lady. Yeah. Um, <laughs> again, not to not to harp on my uh, uh, on my point of us becoming aeons, becoming united to the aeons, but we just that we don't get sucked up into the one, right? But uh, uh, near the beginning, um, there is. Uh, I, I dispute your we become aeons. I really, it's a it's a supportable, and I and I get it. I wouldn't yeah. dispute it. I'd offer an alternative, but keep going. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. So uh, the, it's uh, uh, near the beginning when it's talking about uh, some of the different uh, different aeons and stuff. There's and in the fourth aeon were placed the souls who did not understand their perfection yet they did not repent immediately but they persisted a while. In the end, however, they repented. They will remain in the fourth light, Eliath, the one who yoked them to himself, glorifying the invisible spirit. 
having been gathered to that place, glorifying the invisible spirit. Now, this is very confusing because this is this passage is uh, before creation, right? right? So, who who are these repentant souls? Um, um, and, and Dr. Plasha points out that oh, well, like. Even before, uh, quote unquote, wisdom's error, the, before the fall, the, before human creation, you know, this, this takes place before that, meaning that somebody knows it's going to happen. Um, and also, that's where the repentant souls will go, uh, where forever they will glorify the invisible spirit. It's, it's actually a, a little bit confusing, too, about who the repentant souls are, if that's just every soul that finds gnosis, or if that is, you know, somebody who uh, needs to repent. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, but that is reiterated later. So uh, later on, they, they mentioned, you know, uh, uh, where, the, uh, uh, where the souls go, and they mentioned uh, LEF uh, again. Uh, also, yeah. sorry, at, at the beginning, um, uh, when, uh, when, when uh, John is, is pondering, he says, and of what sort is that aeon to which we will go? He told right. us that the aeon is modeled on that indestructible aeon, but he did not teach us what, the, what sort the latter is. Um, which also sort of indicates that we become united with some sort of aeon, probably LEF. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, each of the... So this is the... LLF is one of the four luminaries who surround Autogenes Christ yeah. um, in, the, in the divine unfolding. Um, and each of those four luminaries gathers some souls to themselves. Yeah. So the unrepentant ones go to, the, to LLF to the fourth, but then the other three also you know various levels of sainthood you wind up in one of the other four luminaries is the is the aeon that you you is your home um i guess the, I'm... Aeons, are, the aeons are also called realms and of course aeon is a duration of time so it's like but of course it's not meant to be time because there is no time but it's you know it is trying to conceive of uh, the text seems to be indicating something that is a being uh, an entity a god that is also uh, an age and a place an and... age and a place yeah. And also possibly a people. At sometimes it's called the, the. It refers to races or or ethnos. I think in Greek. Um, yeah. So there's some sense in which it's a it's a people as well. So yeah, smushy, yeah. smushy the ancient mind. Everything joins up. <laughs> less of this, less of this uh, distinct separateness that we're so obsessed with in the modern era. Also, uh, something that I, I never really noticed uh, in the text before. Do you notice that aeons uh, descend upon us? And that's an important part of salvation? Because no. unfortunately... Yeah. <laughs> it's near the end. Um, okay. it's, yeah, it, it's like a... Uh, it, it's a counter to the counterfeit spirit. Uh, unfortunately, the translation that I, uh, that I was reading used realms. But it's, uh, it's Dr... It, again, it's Dr. Plesha that, that pointed it out in, in his talk. And it's like, it's only like, it's like two quick passages. So, so it might be the same as, as the spirit of life because it seems that the, the soteriology of, of Secret John is, you know, you strive for Gnosis. Uh, whatever you do, you do not backslide. Mm. because it has some very strong if you start on this path and you backslide it has some very strong language for you and then yes. at some point the, the spirit of truth the spirit of life will descend upon you and also an aeon will descend upon you right uh, yes. or the aeon might also be the spirit of life um so but it's very unclear but to make a long story short the text says that aeons will descend upon you uh dr Plesha <laughs> makes <laughs> See, and you definitely, I mean, you see versions of that reflected through subsequent esoteric teaching for a couple of thousand years after, yes. afterwards. Yeah. yeah. And, and Dr. Plesha uh, ties that into uh, this idea of, well, you know, the materiality can't be saved, right? So what is, what is, what is some of the point of this? Yes, there is, there is that spark of Sophia, which, you know, it, it seems like throwing a, an Aeon in there to, to descend upon you almost seems like overkill, right? So, so why, why, why is this process happening? And his contention is this, this is part of the wisdom of God. This is part of God knowing itself. The aeons have to descend into materiality so that they can experience everything, so they can have uh, more wholeness. Right. I mean, I, I think this, this goes to some of what was coming up for me before when you were, um, when I said I, I just 
dispute your interpretation. I'm, I correct that. I'm not. I'm not going to dispute your interpretation. I think. I think there's something that's kind of pointed to implicitly in the text, not explicitly, right? Yeah. Um, the formation of Adam, and I'm, you know, tactically not saying Adam, mm -hmm. like Adam, right? Um, to kind of make it seem a little bit unfamiliar, the 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 creation of Adam is a um, is a parody of the creation of autogenies, right? Yes. So the the Aeonic version of, of the human is the perfected version of the human. And, and what Yaldabaoth creates and the Archons create is, is, a, is a, well, the best they could do, given the circumstances, right? And into that is breathed the spirit of Sophia, which is, the, which is ultimately the breath of the invisible spirit descended through the Aeons, through the matched pairs of Aeons through Sophia into Yaldabaoth and then into Adam and and also into Eve, the mother of the living, um, and hence into us, right? But so what do we get handed? Like, what are we handed as human beings? So what's this humanness that we're handed? So it's materiality, which is described as chaos, or nothikrasi, the mother of chaos is the, the you know, the, the mother of the, of the, of matter. And it, and it takes a sort of more or less what we'd recognize from neo, from neoplatonism is matter is just confused yeah. it's a muddle everything's kind of mixed up there's no clarity to it you know so what you're saying is um uh, just to clarify and, and with a with a careful reading of this text uh, i think i can back this up is uh matter is evil and so are bodies <laughs> would that would that be a good summation of what you're what you're saying because that's what the text says right it's absolutely not what the text says nice digression Good, good marginal note. Um, it's absolutely not what the text says. No, it, it actually says very little about matter. The vast bulk of the vast bulk of what the text talks about in the creation of the human being is the creation of the human soul, um, or the the soul body. And it goes to some. It's confusing because it goes into extensive detail about the left testicle and the right testicle of the soul body. And this is on the long version of Secret John. The left ear and the right ear, the various the, the kidneys of the soul body and the and the the withers and loins and so on of the soul body. So it goes into extensive anatomical detail of the soul body, but it's talking about a soul body. It's not talking about a physical body. And having gone to all this painstaking construction of the the in in modern post theosophical parlance, you might say the astral body or the etheric body, perhaps, um, is cast into matter. So the very final stage is. Well, so there's matter and matter's confused and weird and chaotic and difficult to make sense of. And there are archons that oversee it and whatever. Um, but it's not particularly evil. Yeah. The text doesn't paint it as particularly evil or as a particular problem, except that it's confusing and yes. muddled. So the soul body's placed kind of like as the final step. It's kind of like, okay. And as if that wasn't bad enough, we're going to put you in this confusing materiality, which is just going to be... Um, I think I think the the most accurate interpret the, the most accurate way to phrase it is it's it's distracting. Yes. Materiality is very distracting, yeah. um, but it's not fundamentally the problem. the The text goes to great lengths to explain that fundamentally the problem is the human psyche. Yeah, yeah. Which means like soul, the soul, the human soul, the psyche, the our interior experience of our in, interior self alienation and fragmentation. Yeah. Um, I I, I mean, you know, j just uh, just compare uh, how many how many times the text talks about uh, the body uh, with um, uh, with the counterfeit spirit and fate. Like, you know, those are and, uh, and as you said, you know, what is what the, the division of the human being uh, due to the counterfeit spirit? Like right. that's that's what the text is really obsessed about, and it, that's really what it what. What it says is the problem. Now, now it does say that, that the body is a prison. It does mention the cave at least three times. It's getting that straight from Plato. Plato said the body is a prison, right? right? Like I, I actually find like yeah, okay, the text. Really, really Gnostic. It's it's everyone. Everyone. It's says... everyone. And yeah. in some ways, not not only is it everyone. You know, I would say that this text is is um, a little less extreme than most of its contemporaries. Now you know. Now, does it sync up, a, you know, 1,000% with, with modern uh, body positivity? 
you know, uh, you, you, maybe not. But Probably. you know, compare it, compare it to uh, the Platonists, compare it to Paul, compare it to many other, many, 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 many other forms of Christianity, both then and now. It's, it's, you know, the body is not the problem in comparison. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's anti-cosmic, but you've got to understand what what the cosmos is, and the cosmos is the system of of fate, the, which is intertwined with the fragmentation of the human mind and it's the fragmentation of the human mind that's the fundamental thing we we're 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 committed to overcoming and it's the you know as you know if you spent 15 or 20 seconds trying to you know notice what's happening in your mind if you've made the terrible mistake of trying to undertake a meditation practice at some point in your life you may have noticed <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I think I've said this on the show. I, I've definitely said it to you. If you want to know the archons, if you want to know the reality of the rulers, to quote the, the title of a Gnostic text, then sit down and meditate for five minutes. You'll meet them pretty quick. Yeah, um, a, the, uh, we'll, we'll just go into social life and hang around other human beings because um, yeah. they show up all around you. Or yeah. are they? You know, <laughs> like, no, not so much. So just to come back, just to kind of come back and round off the thing I was trying to say before. So the, yeah. the, the reality of our situation, right, the, to come back to kind of like, hey, welcome to adult life. Um, you, I, I think we're supposed to be in union with the divine, but that doesn't seem to be the current situation. What actually is the current situation? So the picture that we're painted from the text is, okay, so like we're deeply fragmented in our internal life. Yeah. Um, we're, we're riven by impulses and, um, and thought streams and, and feelings and emotions that we to come from nowhere we have no account no adequate account to give in, to give of them um we somewhere in the core of us we feel intuitively and and the saints assure us this is the case there is the very breath of the divine in the in the heart of the human being and that you can tell that's there but it's almost impossible to be with or to notice or to or to realize um, and to make matters worse, we're placed in material reality, which is constantly trying to attract our attention and, and is confusing us all the time and is constantly demanding our attention and awareness. So any attempt to draw our awareness in to focus on the, the issues of, of self-alienation and fragmentation that we, we, we need to really be focusing on in order to realize that in a divine nature is fraught because we've got to handle the, the, problem, the problem of materiality. Um, yeah. Ah, what are we supposed to do? So, so the problem that we're set in the text is that's our situation. But that situation... So the interesting thing is that that setup is an attempt to recreate the perfect human. That's the, that's the image of the perfect human. <laughs> yes, Which, yes. Which St. Paul assures us one day we will see face to face, but but right now we're only seeing through a glass and that darkly, you know. Yes. Um, so that that this healing of this fragmentation and self alienation project that that we have to undertake results in some more faithful image of that divine human that was presented to our Creator. Yeah. Um, that's what enables us to kind of take our place amongst the the luminaries, you know, circling as part of the divine realm. So, um, and the, hmm, other things, too many other things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I definitely agree on that. And I, and I think that's exactly what it's saying. And, you know, I would say, um, drawing on uh, some of the more political readings of, of the text, um, or there's, a, oh, there's a really great book called uh, A Book um off air we often joke about okay so I, i've talked about this in the show before you know the the gnostic greeting the the secret handshake of gnostics the secret uh uh greeting is have you read right because there's always right. another book to read That's but awesome. uh yeah wrestling with archons by john vingahana bloom it's only it's less than 200 pages it's a relatively quick read i think it's a build out of his phd thesis probably um but you know he says i don't you know 100 percent buy this thesis but i'm going to say i buy this thesis because i'm using it in my thesis for school so it is 100 percent correct which is the gnostics were the first to do critical theory you know okay. a, uh, a phrase that is uh that, that is, has been in the news lately. Uh, they, they are doing critical philosophy, critical theory, comparable to the, to what's, what was going on in the 20th and uh, 21st century. But they can only use the language and concepts that they have. 
right? Which mm -hmm. are religious languages and concepts. So they, when they're talking about, so when we're talking about what is, what is the matter of the human condition is, is we have this internal thing. We are divided beings, right? Uh, everything that you just talked about, but all the fate stuff, uh, as well as the bad rulership of the world by the, by the Demiurge, who is, you know, also probably the, the emperor of Rome. Uh, Archon just means ruler. It, the, the modern equivalent would be something like mayor or congressperson, right? Because it's right, literally right. what, Archon is literally what you call the guy who rules your, your, your town, county, I think, if, I, I think if you're in a Greek Orthodox parish, then the Archons of the parish council is actually... Oh yeah, yeah. It's a very, it's a very common term. But it's, it's, it's in in that context. Then it would have been, you know, like if if I wrote the text now, you know, the demiurge would be president and archons would be congress people. That that's how right. it would be for for ancient people. They would see the word archon and they would immediately know who you're talking about. You're talking about your local ruler. Um, so you know, his contention is that. Uh, that it is two things, right? It is this internal division, but it is the the oppressive world system that we live in, right? That is the, that is badly run. Uh, and when when the Gnostics were talking about fate, they are also partly talking about that that world system, right? When they're talking right. about the Archons, they're also partly talking about that world system. But but of course, you know, it does work. You know, it sounds like I'm contradicting myself, but of course, the the writers of this text, the writer of this text, did mean it on those levels, right? They meant it internally. You know, the Archons are in here. Uh, they meant it externally. And actually, modern uh, secular people would say that as well. If you're a political person who leans left, um, try not to get in trouble, uh, then, you know, there's false consciousness, right? Which is, which means that there are these, these external uh, uh, forces of control, but they get into your brain. Um, uh, yeah. so, well, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd argue, I'd, I guess I'd argue it goes both ways. Like, I mean, if you've, if you've worked in an organization of any kind, <laughs> a church, company, scout troop, whatever, um, you know, we're all walking around in self-alienation. We're all walking around with repressed psychological material that, you know, we're, we're not handling consciously, um, which we tend to go through psychological processes of projection and interjection around. Um, we don't handle very well. We get triggered all over the place. We have feelings we can't account for. Um, and, and we deal with those as though we're in a family again. If you've, I mean, if you've worked in an organization, you've watched people, you know, come up with fantastic stories about each other that are really about the denied aspects of themselves. And, you know, you put three people together in a room, <laughs> wherever two or more are gathered together, it's about time to undertake some psychological projection, as I think Jesus said, mm, I may be misquoting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you just watch that in a little group of, of three people, you know, where, you know, like two of them decide they don't like the third one and start having a kind of a side conversation. This is politics in its most atomistic frame. And, and th those political maneuvers are driven by our own psychological fragmentation. So the yeah. psychological fragmentation exteriorizes itself as, as a political reality, which gradually becomes an en masse political reality. And then we see our own fragmentation confirmed in the political reality that's handed back to us. And so the whole thing's in a, in a kind of a self-reinforcing cycle. So it's not, there's no, there's no distinction really even going on here. There's absolutely no separateness between what goes on in us psychologically and what goes on in our societies politically, right? I mean, yes. we all, those of us that live in alleged democracies are generally living in two party states where there's literally two parts to the political mind, which is at war with each other and which from the outside it's very difficult to sometimes tell the difference between yeah yeah though no, uh it reviles the other as the as the denied shadow you know like it's it's hilarious yes yeah exactly exactly um okay what do we what else do we have on our on our secret list of <laughs> misconceptions <laughs> and not so secret list of misconceptions hang on yeah what have i done with mine um uh... I had it, and then I have lost it. Hang on, it's just, it's just here. Wait a second. Well, while you're taking it up, the, the, this only recently uh, occurred to me, and uh, I'm really sorry, Tony, but uh, Gnostic consent isn't in the text. Um, it's not. That's fair. Uh, we, we are through the topics we said we'd talk about. Um, that's true. It's not. Um directly i mean it's kind of implied because there's sort of a descent process that gets us to where we are 
Yeah. So it's not crazy to imagine that that's painting a picture of kind of a sent back. Well, that's how it works in other texts, right? Like for sure. But we we're, we're saved by the descent of the uh, of the aeon, or or by the spirit of truth. That that's the soterology. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The um the the guidance of Epinoia, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um who is the, the antidote to the counterfeit spirit. That's not super clear, but I think it's a supportable kind of interpretation. The guidance of Epinoia, or as we'd call her in the modern era, the Holy Spirit, I think. I don't, I don't think that's a big stretch. The Holy Spirit's not Sophia. That's not a question. Um, I think when you read what the, the role of Epinoia is in the text, and then you read how, particularly in the Orthodox Church, they talk about the Holy Spirit, it's the same deal like it's the same it's soteriologically the same figure um yeah it's the guidance of the holy spirit and then gradually it's the unification of the of the kind of conventional mind with the mind of christ um in other words the aeon descending upon the human being and the two becoming into union um that gets framed different ways in different eras of christian history and different various denominational schisms and whatever but it's it's basically that's the that's the process yeah, um, yeah, and and I think that's the process uh, in here too. Now, not to say that other texts don't have a Gnostic ascent, and Gnostic ascent isn't very uh, important. Um, I guess you can you can read it in as because I think the soterology is you you have to do things that get you gnosis. You like you have to work towards gnosis, and I think I I which think would it's be like... Gnostic ascent would be. Would be the well, but where where are you ascending to? Because when you die, you're only going to end up in Elia for one of those other four luminaries. Yeah, fr framing, <laughs> it, framing it as ascent. Well, what I think is implicit in the text, and perhaps not super clear, is that it makes a big production number about how we're all bound by fate. Yes, and when they say fate, they mean astro astrology. Really, they mean we're we're bound by the influence of the planets on our human soul. There's a lot of a there's a big production number about the archons that rule you know the the rulers of the planets, um, and there's a thing there's a piece about how they've got their kind of like their name that gives them power and their name that disempowers them. Yeah. So each of them has two names, and if you know the name that disempowers them, that the the I think it's um this is implied but perhaps not clearly stated. If you use the name that disempowers them, if you know them by that name, that weakens the influence of that planet that planet on your psyche which is partly what brings the human psyche back into balance so it's a um i mean that's that's the same thing that a planetary ascent yeah that's true yeah yeah like if you if you're undertaking you know like the aurum solus material or um the rituals of planetary ascent they're partly about kind of coming into a direct relationship with each of the planetary the Olympic planetary spirits or the planetary angels or whatever. And, and that interaction with the planetary spirit is meant to be kind of harmonizing and balancing out the influence of the planet in your psyche. And that brings you closer to your genius or your holy guardian angel or divine union. And, you know, that's what kind of creates in, in secret John terms, that's what kind of opens the, the capacity for the psyche to allow the descent of the Aeon. So it's an, it's an ascent process in other traditions. I think it's, not i think it is fair to say that specific bit of it isn't really necessarily an ascent process as it's phrased here but it does talk about an ascent process there's there's the the human souls you know freeing sophia so that sophia can ascend you know and return to the to the realm of the aeons we're leaving the realm of the demiurge and moving it, it never really frames these as up and down exactly but we're kind of ascending into the realm of the four luminaries there's ascending going on, but it's all, as with everything in Secret John, it's complex and there's multiple places and it doesn't all kind of, there's plot holes that you can drive a truck through and it's all a bit complicated and weird. Yeah, no, th that's a really good point. Sorry, Tony, wherever you are, if you're watching this, you better be. Um, you're, you're deeply wrong, but also very right. Yeah, no, that, that is a good point. Although that's very subtle and it's like, uh, and of course, Gnostic Ascent is still like, I think you can see it more clear in some of the other texts, but even then, of course, it is subtle. It's never laid out because it was probably a quote unquote secret technology, right? Apart from so, uh, Gospel of Mary, yes. it's pretty explicit, um, yeah. I think. Um, yeah. 
that's probably the main one. But yeah, yeah. But but you're right. The the double names d does indicate that. Um, and th that's more explicit in say the the Corpus Hermeticum, where it's like uh, the, uh, there's some of the texts that are very like, okay, the planet gives you this. Uh, that's bad, and you need to get rid of that. <laughs> so yeah. it's got a list of what what it, the, the seven bad qualities, which of course later become in the Christian tradition the uh, uh, seven deadly sins. Uh, and you need to cast those off. How do you cast off? How do you uh, how do you uh, cast it off? Well, you ascend past that planet, uh, and uh, once you're outside of its influence, you no longer have that quality in yourself. So uh, so it is it is very explicit there. Um, but but you're right. Yeah, the, uh, the 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 fascinating thing about the double the, is that the sequence with the double name thing, where all the names uh, that are known are like good things, because there's actually another there's another Sophia, like one of the um, so the because uh, I'm assuming it's because the archons are are made in the image of the aeons or parodies of the aeons. There's like a sequence that's like well they have this 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 public name and then they have a secret name and the public name is all good stuff, right? It's stuff like wisdom, life. Uh, what have you, which uh, which of course is also meant to be a uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the the uh, the conception about Gnosticism as a parody of religion, I have, uh, which uh, a lot of people have turned away from, or is an interrogation of religion, or a way of understanding religion, not just Christianity and Judaism, religion in general. I think yeah. is spot on. Uh, and that's what's going on there because it's like, oh, okay, well, you think this thing is wisdom, you think this thing is life, you think this thing is spirit, you think this thing is good. Well, actually, it's bad. And actually, if you it. do, it's a bad thing and it's tricking you. And if you knew its secret name, then you'd actually know it. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Hey, temple theology. You probably don't have anything to say about that. <laughs> well, I mean, I think what's eye catching about I, before we get to temple theology, I did just want to say, like, I did just want to say, like, I think this is to come back to the thing of like this. This text is life, but also it's trash. Um, yeah, and I think I think that deep ambivalence is really crucial. I, yes, I. There's a tendency, particularly if you've come from a Protestant background, but I think for most Christians because of the way scripture's treated like the literal word of god and you have to spend all your time desperately trying to understand what it's trying to tell you so that you can you know like what is god speaking to me through the text i have to understand all the things which reaches its kind of like nadir if i can say in some strains of um of protestantism where the bible's treated like a like a car manual you know like where you you read that, like, okay, it says that there, so that's what I've got to go do, because it says it, right? It's, like, which is just a, it's terrible. It's a terrible use of, misuse of scripture. Um, that's the way scripture's been used and interpreted in Christian tradition for quite a long time. Well, so, yeah, quite a long time. It's a very Protestant thing, because, yeah. you know, prior to that, nobody read it. It's, Guten, it's Gutenberg that gave anybody the ability to actually read the Bible. Prior to that, you read it if you're a priest or a monk, but if you're an ordinary person, you didn't have access to it. You got readings in church. It was told to yeah. you, you know, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, ordinary people didn't read the Bible as a way to understand anything in particular because you simply couldn't. It's crazy talk. Yep. Regardless well, of that, that's, yeah. that's a Christian predisposition. That's not what's going on in this text. And I, and I think, I think it's, I, I find, I think it's helpful to look at the text, not in its, like in the, details of it and in what it proposes you might set out to do it may just be wrong like yeah. <laughs> yes yes in the, yeah. in the broad brush strokes and the ways it reflects back the reality of you as a human being i think it's it's really quite correct so yeah. it's worth understanding in a detailed way in the sense at which it seems to be telling you the truth but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to slavishly obey every single thing it claims about your afterlife what spiritual practice might look like how you might go about resolving the issue. That's like, like a bunch of people had some ideas and people had crazy ideas back then. Like, yes. or, or ideas that I think we, we wouldn't necessarily agree with in the present day. You, you name check the seven deadly sins before. Like one of the, one of the other touchstones for that is the, the, the eight logismoi of Evagrius of Pontus, the great, the great desert father, um, who's just, luminous in terms of his psychological grasp of the the various things afflicting the mind of a monk desperately trying to pray but his 
you know, and he, he listed these sort of eight, not just more, these kind of like troubling thoughts that afflict your mind if you, and we're all familiar with them. If you, if you sit down and try to meditate, you know, there's a predictable range of things that happen. You, you, you're hungry, you know, you, you might be, you might just be a bit listless and not able to concentrate. You might. You might... Sorry to interrupt, but I, I, I didn't understand why all these monks like St. Anthony, what, what have you, were so obsessed with, with sex and sexual temptation until I went on a 10 day meditation retreat. 100%. And I, well, you, I, you, I was you, shocked. Well, you only get, you only get one meal a day. <laughs> yeah. So gluttony comes up and you're not allowed to touch anybody or speak to anyone. And so yeah. sexual desire comes up and, and vainglory is like great. Like he talks about like the monk being taken up with, with the, the fantasy of being acclaimed as a bishop by the people and carried off by beautiful maidens to be made into a bishop of the church, you know, and these, these fantasies of like of fame and glory kind of coming into the head. So all these things happen, right? Like it's complete. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're troubling thoughts that occur when attempting serious spiritual practice, to be clear. They're not sins in the sense. That goes on to, um, that goes through John Cassian to Europe, and then it goes to Gregory the Great, and Gregory the Great kind of takes those ideas and, and smushes them with the, I think probably with the hermetic tradition, and they become the seven deadly sins, which are things people do, not thoughts people might have. And, and it, it has its own vexed history in European Christianity. But Evagrius is remedy for these thoughts was to shout psalms at them yeah. so there's a whole book where he recommends which psalm to shout at which thought that was his that was his remedy for what to do about it which i mean i guess i guess it, i haven't really tried it perhaps it might work i don't really know um i suppose distract your mind with with the kind of thought that you're meant to be speaking is not a not a bad approach but i wouldn't necessarily recommend that you know if you're troubled by troubling thoughts that you start shouting psalms at your thoughts necessarily that's not, it's probably not a goer for most people so sorry massive digression by way of saying i'm not necessarily sure the prescriptions that might have been given to people about how to undertake this work at that time is necessarily the same thing that one might undertake in the present day because in terms of like dealing with self-alienation and, and psychic fragmentation that we have a lot more tools in the toolkit now than perhaps they did back then um yes. yeah I I, I, some of the more tools that, yeah. Some of the modern tools of psychotherapy and self therapy, and you know, uh, you know, twelve step groups and addiction recovery and stuff has some really lovely tools and um, and so on. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree, and, I, and I'm glad you gave that clarification. It goes back to the clarification at the very beginning that I was talking about, right? That that it's it's not only how we read religious te texts, but I think it's how we should read religious texts. And sometimes when we're, you know, the, I want to do the show just to. To, to kind of take the text on its own terms, right? But then we can throw it in the in the garbage, uh, <laughs> you know. Once we figure out what those terms are, and and, and that has been a, a criticism, and I'm sure probably still is a criticism of of our particular community, right? Of the Apostolic Illinois Church is that oh, well, you know, they're not they're not actually Gnostics, you know. They they bring in all this, uh, they smush together a bunch of different texts, and they don't even you know follow exactly what the Cephians said, and yada yada. And it's like, well, we've never claimed to, and mm -hmm. one that would be insane. It's not the second century <laughs> like that that's crazy talk uh and and you know and, and three i'm not the only person that that believes this there are serious scholars that believe it as well i i think anybody who reads the text it, it's pretty easy to pick up these were written as myths you know like obviously they're plato fanboys plato talked about the the importance of of uh, of myth of creating good myths instead of bad myths he also talks about myths he doesn't like um you know th this was created as as a myth as mythology um right. and um uh we should treat it as such and we should adapt it for our modern day and we should read it with some other things and we should also you know at the same time you can't you can't go through life uh, without developing perhaps some serious mental problems uh, and you can't go on a spiritual path if, if you're too open right you, you have to have some guidance you have to have some beliefs you have to have something but you know i mean if you get too tight on anything well that, that that's not going to be very helpful I, again i'm kind of uh, resorting to cliches <laughs> um you know this probably seems very obvious to a lot of our audience but it's it's, it's deeply true just like you know this book 
yeah, I think one of the central messages it has, and which is also a cliche, is that you you have to live, and you have to live in material out uh, in the material realm. Uh, for wisdom to grow, uh, for divinity to fix itself, for divinity to come back together. You know, that that's what I what I really see. Like, um, and uh, uh, for us all being messed up in the head, right? Um, I think a lot of times when Gnostics and people interested in Gnosticism and related traditions, they talk about the human as divine, right? They, you know, that, 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 that's, that's a very important point for a lot of people. Um, and and I, I see this as, as a text that, that really emphasizes that. However, I read it as saying, you know, the human is divine and the divine is human because the divine's a little screwed up and it's working through some stuff. <laughs> like, just like what you're talking about, like, you know, obviously the, the primal man is, is more perfect than us, but maybe everything's not that perfect in the Aeonic realm, as we talked about. Well, the, by definition, it can't be. By the logic of this book, by the rules of this book, the Aeonic realm can't be perfect. The divine else. went insane. Yeah, yeah, the divine went insane. Uh, uh, I, I can't remember who said it. I think it was Eric Davis, but, you know, Gnosticism is... Uh, Gnosticism is the story of uh, how God had a mental breakdown, became us, and how we can reverse the process. That's, you that's, know, that's, I, that's putting it. Yeah, that's a good way yeah. of putting it. Yeah. So, yeah, but uh, I, 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 and I think too, when we understand that 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 we're screwed up because God is screwed up, we we want to strive to be something more than what we are. But we often become more than what we are by understanding who we are and what we are and by accepting what we are and what we think right. is darkness, right? right. Uh, which, which I think we can also read into this text. You know, I, I think the text does suggest that. And, and I really hate, I, I've always been drawn to Gnosticism because I think it does take suffering seriously. And I, I think the text is saying something more deliberate and more deep then the material realm is here for us to learn. I know that's what what I've been what it sounds like I've been saying, um, because I've never liked that because it's like you know the children whose eyes are being eaten by parasites, like they they don't they don't need to be sent to this realm to learn that. But I think, and, and maybe there isn't much of a difference that that this process is inevitable and this is the only way that the divine can have a kind of wholeness and know itself. So it, it's, it's neither good nor bad. It's not that we've been sent here to learn or the divine created the world to learn, but it is an inevitable process that began when the one looked into that water. Um, right. and, and the process ends perhaps not in perfection, but, um, in, you know, something better than this. That that holy division that I was talking about uh, two hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> that that's my take. That's my take. You know, take that with a grain of salt. And, yeah, and that but... also that also goes into my more depressing you know, take on Gnosticism. It gives you, you know? an. I mean, it, it gives you a kind of interesting theodicy, right? Like it's an interesting kind of a, a attempt to. You know, in, in mainstream Christianity, they, they talk about the problem of evil a great deal. That um, in the, the whole of Gnosticism is a is is one way to address that that issue. Yeah, yeah? Um, how can God be like omnipotent, all powerful, and and benevolent, and also behold the world? Right, like what's going on with that? Because children get their eyes eaten by parasites, etc. Right. Yeah. Um, all sorts of bad bad stuff happens in this world that, that we're told God created, God's all powerful and can see it all and uh, is apparently benevolent. How does that all work? Um, Gnosticism in general says, well, you got to understand there's the God that created the place and there's the, there's the benevolent perfect God. But I, I think at its, at its peak, I think Secret John's not even saying that the, the monad is benevolent, even. No. The monad is simply whole. Yes. Um, that's it. <laughs> um, and, and within that, frankly, God's kind of insane and self-alienated as well. And, uh, the world that we're in is the result of that fact. Um, the human beings that we are is 
the result of that fact. And yeah, all we can do is take our little part of trying to heal that fragmentation, reweave some wholeness, um, and you know, be part of one little step to to kind of make the whole more whole, I guess.